Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kevin Kearns. I'm on the faculty at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs, and I also have the privilege of directing the Johnson Institute for Responsible Leadership. Uh, I'm the one standing in front of you today, but I'm not the one that made uh, today happen. Uh, the people who helped make today happen are Lydia McShane, my associate in the back of the room, and three very good students who've been working with us uh, at the Johnson Institute, Emma Yord, uh, Katie Gascoigne, and Justin Shaw. Uh, Katie, in particular, was very, very helpful in selecting this year's um, award winners, so we're very, very grateful to Katie. And other students have been involved in helping us at the door and guiding people in and so on, so I'm very, very grateful to them. Uh, <clears throat> The Johnson Institute is uh, within the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. Its mission is to promote leadership uh, in public service. Uh, we do that through a mixture of teaching programs, research, public service. And we give two awards every year. Uh, the first we call the uh, um, uh, Exemplary Leader Award. Uh, and it's usually given in the spring, and, and usually to someone pretty much later in their career for kind of a lifetime achievement. But a few years ago, we felt that it was important to give an award to people who are relatively early in their career, uh, who've already accomplished remarkable things, and also have a deep horizon ahead of them. Uh, we do this for several reasons, not only to celebrate the incredible leadership uh, in Pittsburgh and elsewhere. Not all of our award winners are from Pittsburgh. But also to provide inspiration for our students, that um, one doesn't have to get to look like me, <laughs> if you will, uh, before one uh, ascends into any type of leadership position. That leadership is not age-based, it's not race-based, it's not position-based. And so today's winners are two people who both in their own way and from very different platforms, but related, are helping to make Pittsburgh a more informed, a more enlightened, a more knowledgeable, a more empathetic and more inclusive community. And I'm very, very pleased to introduce both of them. Now what we'll do today is I would like to introduce both and we can recognize them. And then I'm going to ask um, probably Mila first to come up and say a few words, maybe 15 minutes or so, and then Wasi. But let me first introduce and tell you a little bit about Mila Sanina. Mila is the executive director of Public Source, which is a leading investigative news organization providing in-depth journalism on local and regional issues. Mila's journalistic career spans uh, a number of different organizations and different roles. She was with the PBS NewsHour, she was with CNN International, and with the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Her work at the PBS NewsHour coincided with the Arab Spring, and therefore she was deeply involved in gathering information from Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, and other countries. At CNN International, Mila was an assignment editor at the international desk, and her job was working with 26 international bureaus gathering stories, coordinating the supply of content from all over the world for CNN. After arriving in Pittsburgh, Mila became the deputy director, deputy managing editor, excuse me, of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, where she led innovation in storytelling and writing and worked on integrating print and online operations. Now, I would think most of you in the room are familiar with Public Source. Uh, in my view, it is one of the organizations that is crucial uh, in providing informed and evidence-based journalism on topics of interest to our region. I personally see it as a bastion against the deluge of news that is factually flawed, sometimes intentionally, and helps us really engage in evidence-based dialogue as opposed to ideologically-based dialogue or position-based dialogue. Just for example, this morning I was looking at Mila's website, and right now they're working on projects involving the Pittsburgh Police Bureau and its vendor relationships, 
There's an, a very enlightened discussion on Pittsburgh's opioid crisis as th seen through the eyes of recovering addicts. There's a deeply personal and moving story on racial disparities in Pittsburgh. And there's an analysis on how climate change is impacting Pittsburgh. I mean, these are phenomenal, insightful, evidence-based, investigative journalism stories that are really collectively increasing the sort of civic IQ of our community. And I just couldn't be more pleased with it. Mila was born in the Soviet Union. She grew up in Kazakhstan. But as I read from one story, Pittsburgh owns her heart. She said, it's a perfect place for journalists. The city is full of characters and surprises. And most importantly, it appreciates a good story. She holds a master's degree from the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs, which I said earlier today does is not her qualification for this award, although we are delighted that she is a Gispe graduate. She completed her bachelor's degree in political science and international relations at the American University of Bulgaria, and she was named to Pittsburgh Magazine's 40 Under 40 in 2017. So let's recognize Mila first. Mila. So pleased you're here. So pleased you're here. Such a contributor as is our second winner. Wasi Muhammad is a lifelong Pennsylvania resident. Uh, he was born in Harrisburg, raised in nearby Enola, and moved to Pittsburgh in 2011 to attend the University of Pittsburgh, where he received not one, not two, but three bachelor's degrees, one in philosophy, one in the history and philosophy of science, and one in neuroscience quite a collection of academic uh, rigor and achievement. But he didn't just study here. During his time at Pitt, he helped develop the office of Pitt Serve, which is part of the Division of Student Affairs, focusing on building Pitt's lasting impact with our local community. Also while in school, he directed the food pantry of the Islamic Center of Pittsburgh for two years. And then subsequently, at the ripe age of 22, he was named executive director of the Islamic Center of Pittsburgh. But it's not only from that platform that Wasi is having an impact on our community. He's been recognized as a leader by a number of people who've engaged him in their dialogue. For example, in 2016, he was appointed by Mayor Bill Perduto to the Commission on Human Relations and Welcoming Pittsburgh Commission, which is uh, Mayor Peduto's initiative to make Pittsburgh a more welcoming place. He now serves as chair of Welcoming Pittsburgh. He was appointed by Governor Tom Wolf to serve on the Commission on Asian, Pacific, and American Affairs, and was also named the regional coordinator of an organization called Engage, which is an organization that aims to engage the local Muslim community in civic life through voter registration, leadership training, workshops, and community engagement. Now, when, when Wasi assumed leadership as the, at the Islamic Center, um, it was a time of um, a spike um, in uh, hate crimes and anti-Muslim sentiment. And that spike has unfortunately turned into a barrage over the past two years. But Wasi has said with tremendous optimism, yes, we received plenty of negative messages and threats, but we've also received an overwhelming amount of positive support. Uh, Wasi has helped to create a How to Be a Muslim Ally training program. Uh, they host community potluck dinners to unite Muslims and non-Muslims, and he's a fr frequent participant in public forums of all types to build understanding and trust among diverse communities. Wasi was also recognized by Pittsburgh Magazine as a 40 under 40 and as a who's next in Pittsburgh politics by the incline. He's the youngest member of both of those lists. So let's honor Wasi Muhammad. Wasi. I hope you agree that there could be two n no more deserving people for an award such as this who are playing such a crucial role in our community 
and providing, as I said, not only inspiration for young people, our students, but inspiration for me and people of my generation uh, who, in our darker hours, worry about the future of our country, worry about the future of our civic dialogue, worry about um, uh, things that are too worrisome to even mention. And yet, when I look at people of this generation and with this type of leadership, it inspires a great deal of hope for me and I'm sure for you as well. So, Mila, I'm going to ask you, if you would please, to step up and share with us a few thoughts. Mila Sinema. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kearns, for this honor and for this kind introduction. Um, and many, many thanks uh, for this award, for the committee who decided to award to give me this honor. Uh, when Dr. Kearns called me to tell me that I was among this year's honorees, I was frankly astonished. I kept thanking him again and again, waiting for him to tell me that it was a mistake and that he's rescinding. And um, sort of after I hung up, I thought that a couple of days after I will get that call, but never came, so here I am. Um, you see, I get a lot of credits for things I, I don't deserve because throughout my life I had a lot of people to lean on. A lot of people who have trusted me to tell their stories, people who gave me formidable responsibilities, people including family and bosses who were patient with me and still somehow keep me around. This award uh, belongs to many of them. Um, uh, this award also belongs to Pittsburgh and its caring residents who stay informed, who um, give up uh, sometimes, but always uh, fight cynicism and refuse to be immersed in insignificant trivialities, who care about journalism and work in, day in and day out to keep democracy alive locally uh, by staying informed and advocating for a better Pittsburgh. The biggest honor for me is to be able to do the work that I love in the city that has become my home. I'm also honored to be sharing it um, with my friend Wasi Mohammed, who is a true Mr. Community and seems to have several full-time jobs, including the one where he's regularly, deservedly so, getting recognized for his extraordinary work in the region. I'm never sure what to say uh, when I'm supposed to give remarks to rooms like this, where there's so much brain power, passion, experience, and wisdom. So I'm going to share some of the brief snippets from my experience and talk about freedom broadly and um, zero in on one specific kind of freedom that I'm so passionate about, freedom of the press. When I came to Gispia, I remember um, how one of the first people I met was a Dr. Donald Goldstein, known as Goldie around campus. He was a ball of energy, passionate, inspiring, never boring, he taught history, and he loved his job. You could just tell. Often when I would see him, I often thought of this quote, how one must still have chaos in oneself to be able to give birth to a dancing star. And Goldie was that. I suppose in a strange way, Goldie was the one who inspired a dancing star in me. I remember interviewing him for an article, and I asked him what advice he would give to students like me. He thought about it and then said, you know what people should do? They should get out more. My advice would be, go out into the world with a pencil that works. Perhaps I took his advice too literally. After graduation, I did leave, to a certain extent, the world of policy analysis and global political economy behind and went into the world of journalism. Many professors, some of whom are here at Gispia, helped me to reignite that passion and the passion that Adgai gave up um, in my native Central Asia. I, I can't um, thank enough uh, Dr. Bill Dunn and Dr. Muge Finkel, who um, played a special role in my, I guess, growth and uh, just uh, uh, fostering my passion. Truth um, gets silenced in the part of the world, um, in a lot of parts of the world today. Uh, journalists lose their lives, get imprisoned and tortured. They, they get labeled as the enemies of the state. They get penalized uh, for thinking for themselves, for quoting people who in their eyes, in the eyes of the tyrants, do not deserve to be heard. 
for covering issues that, in the eyes of the dictators, need to stay under the radar. Every week we hear those stories. Uh, many lives do not get a wide coverage. The death of journalist uh, Jamal Kos Kosogi received recently. But his prominent example for, a per for someone who believed that the Arab people needed a platform to speak their minds, and himself, um, he himself said, I want to speak my mind. It shouldn't be a crime in this world to speak your mind. And he lost his life for it. I'm not going to draw analogies of what is going on in America and what is going on in Turkey, in Russia, in Bulgaria, Saudi Arabia, Central Asia, and the list of many other countries where journalists are dismissed as opposition, fake news, having agenda, or being a part of, an, um, of uh, some kind of advocacy group. Uh, but there are, dan there are dangerous parallels. Truth doesn't get silenced here in America. It gets drowned in noise, in tweets, in irrelevant trivialities. You can see it on the national and local levels. The grind of breaking news, the stream that doesn't necessarily make us smarter or focused on big questions facing our nation or our region. To learn how to live well in a world where everything moves at breakneck speed, we believe at public source that we need to slow down and wise up. We are, we are trying to build a different kind of journalism, one that opens up, gives everyone a seat at the table, create, creates a system of organized listening and smart thinking, news that reflects the way we really are and shape the world we want to live in here in Pittsburgh. We often hear people's complaints about how local news is a waste of time, you know, how much you can listen about weather, traffic, and stealers. And at times, uh, we are offended by the ownership um, of newspapers or uh, corporate TV stations. So at Public Source, we're trying to build a journalism that is truly owned by the community, is the reflection of the community, journalism that gets closer to our unvarnished truth and inspires us to think outside of the box. This is a really personal issue to me and a personal mission and pursuit. You see, um, where I'm from, it's not exactly where people are uh, reading or getting informed on the issues and feeling like their voice gets counted. So it's, it warms my heart when people take articles from public source and take them to public meetings to, questions, uh, to, question, about every th to question officials about quality of air, about uh, fence line monitoring, to race inequality, the young people who write for us and then make waves in their colleges, the people who ask about economic development and is um, our pursuit of corporate uh, giants like Amazon is the right one for the community. Outside of such of um, uh, major events such as war and climate change, it is local political decisions that most affect people's lives. Have our political leaders properly protected our drinking water from lead, our air? Are we, as a city, advancing policies for affordable housing? Are we educating our kids to prepare them for the world that is changing and presents unprecedented challenges? Are we supporting parents who want their kids' lives to be better than theirs? Will we reserve new space for housing for people with limited incomes and how we prevent homelessness? the problem that has become such a prominent problem in a lot of cities around this country and the world. These questions need to be debated openly and transparently at public space. At public source, we believe these questions need to be debated with accountability and without good journalism that does not occur. People want to live in the light of day, be heard, and their lives to be better. Good government requires good, independent local journalism. What makes America great is great journalism. The real crisis in journalism, the real threat to healthy government, is the demise of local reporting. There are many reasons for the demise, not the least of which is that printing technology makes it efficient, inefficient to have newspapers. The business model for sustaining good local journalism has yet to be found. Here in Pittsburgh, public source plays a part in filling this void. 
I, um, when we do accountability work uh, by questioning officials about the decisions that are being made or how are they spending taxpayer money, we are often asking about um, things that, uh, questions that might be perceived as inconvenient. And it's very, un it's very important to understand that it's not about liking somebody or not liking somebody. There are good people everywhere, and some not so good. But what is important for the health of the community is the trust the community has in its institution. It's trust in local government, not, not its individuals. An institutional trust cannot exist without transparency. I also want to say that um, the other part that I have seen happen in a lot of um, parts of the world, including my native home, Kazakhstan, is that powerlessness that overtakes the society is a dangerous disease. When we become cynics and believe that it becomes somebody else's responsibility, that I cannot do anything, that my voice doesn't matter, that the problem is too big to tackle, we lose power again and again and people who want us to feel powerless win. So I guess I'm gonna leave you with uh, two uh, quotes. One comes from Václav Havel, who talked a lot about the power of the powerless. And he said that vision is not enough. It must be combined with venture. It is not enough to stare up the steps. We must step up the steps. And I, I do think that, you know, you can, you can be frustrated and you can, especially in these times when the, the circumstances and the problems that are ahead of us are so big and unsurmountable. But we, do, we, cannot, live, uh, we cannot leave behind the faith that our, wh how we choose to spend our time, how we st uh, uh, stay informed and involved in our community really, really matters. And we cannot give in to the powers of cynicism and uninvolvement. Because the truth is that the world is really beautiful. And our city of Pittsburgh is fantastic. And if we are not sometimes baffled and amazed and undone by the world around us, rendered speechless and stunned, perhaps we are not paying close enough attention. Thank you. Mila, thank you, that's fantastic. Uh, I'll ask Wasi to come up, and then after Wasi speaks, we'd like to have kind of a dialogue with you. So uh, then I'll ask Mila and Wasi to have a seat, and we'll take questions and engage in some conversations. So Wasi, thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm glad that we split the award because it's called the Emerging Leader. And uh, I'm emerging and she's the leader, so like it makes sense. Uh, I do as much as I can to sit on panels with Mila because if our names are beside each other enough, I, I look more famous. Um, uh, so congratulations. Another round of applause. It was a great talk. Thank you so much. Um, so also, I don't like prepared remarks, so I, I try to jot things down right now, and we'll see how this goes. Um, the one thing I did, I like to open with uh, awards things are, you know, difficult to accept. I mean, there's something in Islam that it's good to recite before. Allahumma ja'alni khayrun mimma yadhuna wa li ma la ya'lamun wa la tawakkadina bi ma yaqulun. So Allah, make me better than what they think of me and forgive me for what they do not know about me and do not take me to account for what they say about me. So if you say nice things, I'm not accountable anymore. Like, <laughs> I, don't, uh, I don't buy it. So um, I was trying to think about what to talk about. You know, like uh, I don't, uh, um, it's kind of difficult, you know, to kind of figure out what specifically I should say, you know, all the different hats. You know, the Islamic Center of Pittsburgh is where I do most of the work that I do and, and it's a great community. So I wanted to start with the concept of 
responsible leadership, you know, a little bit. I was reading the sign. That's what I came up with. <laughs> um, so uh, Johnson said a responsible leadership. So i uh, especially thankful to the Islamic Center and, and the board. Salaam alaikum, sister Lane. <laughs> and uh, my parents and other groups have allowed me to uh, fail enough, you know, like, uh, so that I know what is not responsible in leadership. <laughs> and uh, that's helped me to get there. So one of the first things that I can think of is um, when I started at Pitt, right, my, my weird combination of majors was about this uh, trying to better understand human behavior, right, like neuroscience, philosophy, people, you know, like the science of how people think, the, the philosophy behind, you know, like thought and, and all of this stuff, and, and the philosophy of science and the cultural aspects of science and how we came to decisions. Took a bunch of religious studies courses and, and pursued that more in our interfaith relations, and that was really fascinating to me. Why do people make decisions? <laughs> that was kind of hard for me to figure out. And I volunteered a lot, and I saw all these like uh, injustices and inequalities, and it's also related to people making decisions, because we have things in this country. You know, we are doing well. There's a lot of wealth, but there's so much inequality that people are still suffering. So why that was the case was really what I really wanted to focus on. Pitt serves uh, came from that you know, passion of trying to figure out what can the university do to address this? Because like, we're literally in a tower, <laughs> you know? Um, that's ironic. And, and there's so much need in Pittsburgh, and we have to do our part. So I figured that's how I was going to start it. Um, so here, we're getting to my first irresponsible leadership take. Um, so what I had done there is I spent a lot of time meeting with professors and, and leaders in the community. I had volunteered a bunch, but in planning Pitt Serves, originally, it was conversations about the structure, conversations about governance, conversations about wh where do we get the money from. That was the focus, right? So it, the problem is, is that there's this thought of um, uh, learning um, without thought, you know, is, uh, um, oh, what is that quote? I got it written down, don't worry. <laughs> learning without thought is labor lost, but thought without learning is perilous. <laughs> so the concept of just sitting there in a group and in, in that tower, ironically enough, coming up with the ways that we can best assist the, the community was absolutely the wrong way. We started implementing these pilot projects. You know, then we was like, we need to test stuff, stuff. We need to meet community members. We need to start being active. So that's actually how I started with the food pantry at the Islamic Center of Pittsburgh. And that's what led to me working there eventually. So those interactions at the food pantry, I, I got to much better understand what the university needed to do. And it was really not exactly what we had been talking about. But the problem is, is that that was never part of our dialogue. And that, is cons that happens often, <laughs> you know? Like, and although the people we were talking to you know, like everybody who was involved in the conversations, we, most of them knew much more than I did about any of these things. And I was still basically learning, you know, the basics of community, you know, involvement. I studied neuroscience. We don't cover that in year one or two or three or four. Um, so that was really important. And, but what I realized is that um, just because we could articulate better what challenges people were facing, you know, what the issues were in the city because of, you know, the books that we've read, it does not mean that we should not talk to the people actually impacted at all. And more so, even if those people that we talk to um, say things, you know, like there's, there's a thought that it, the cry of the poor is not always just, you know, that, um, but you will never understand justice unless you hear it, right? If you do not have that conversation, if you do not dig there, you can never really get to the root of issues, you can never get to the root of problems, and you may mistake them for something else. So what I realized is that the conversations was lacking, right? And I think that kind of leads me to several other issues and mistakes I've made, but mainly I think the biggest thing that's at the root of a lot of these is not enough conversations before taking action. Um, and uh, that's a major problem. American problem in the sense that we are as partisan as we've ever been. <laughs> Right, like we've never been as divided based on statistics and studies and whatever, and um, uh, never has, like I think it's like 40% of people like have a negative, they think somebody who belongs to the opposite political party is a bad person <laughs> because of their you know, involvement in that political party. Um, they think that you know, people who have the other views are actually dangerous to this country. Uh, they believe that people like, you know, immigrants or Muslims or people like that are very harmful to the fabric of what America is meant to be. And alternatively, one group thinks that we demand entry no matter what the circumstance or situation, because we deserve it. And that's just the right thing to do without any dialogue on either side. It's just yelling. So this concept of conversations <laughs> and how important that is does not just, you know, refer to service providing, 
but also just any social issues that we're encountering or social problems that we have in society, I think conversations are crucial. And I think that a lot of us, um, and me included, which I didn't realize until I started this job, and at the Islamic Center, we're very diverse. You know, we have over 50 nationalities, people from everywhere, been here for different levels of generations, lots of cultures, languages, et cetera. We have a lot of differing viewpoints. You know, and just because we're all of one faith does not mean we not disagree, <laughs> um, which is great because we've been able to tackle real differences, and that's been huge because I've changed my mind a lot since I started working there, <laughs> and I'm very hard-headed overall, so that took a while, um, but it was important because conversation with like an open mind is really, really important to address most of the issues that we have, and we don't really have enough of it. So um, I just wanted to kind of highlight that. I don't really have too many words of wisdom to share. It's just that what I see is the biggest problem right now. And my time at the Islamic Center and all of these dialogues that we've done, as I've seen, is that uh, real conversations can make real differences. Um, there is that number that Brookings Institute did that uh, registered Republicans, 60% of them did not like Muslims uh, um, at all and didn't believe that they should be in the country, uh, as opposed to 22% um, after you, uh, of the same registered Republicans, but if you have met a Muslim, it's only 22% that don't like us anymore. So simple things like having meetings, talking to people, engaging in dialogue, and not just accusing them or yelling ab about them in our echo chambers of, you know, like uh, social media and whatever else that we do, but actually trying to get out of our um, comfort zones, go meet them, go have these interactions, don't judge them, and assume the best in people, uh, because I feel like if you just take this, these statistics at face value, this is a very disturbing time in American history. It's really, really difficult to see any hope. You know, you look at the city and you don't see the city anymore, you just see its dark corners, you just see the negativity. And it's hard to get over that if you don't believe that there, I truly believe that people at their core are good people. You know, like if you take away some of that stuff that they've been conditioned to believe, they can get to a point where you can coexist with basically anybody. Uh, and we've seen that throughout time. You know, unfortunately, it's just time that causes this to happen, but if we force these conversations, if we try to go out of our spaces and we try to be respectful and we make sure that, the only two things that I wanna make sure to like point out when we leave is that reflect upon what you can change. Are you change, if you're not going into a conversation with the thought that my mind could be changed, then how can you expect somebody else to? You know, like if you cannot grow from an interaction and you come close hearted, then they might also do the same thing. So you have to come with that. That's an important thing to, to focus on. So I've found that the, the most effective ones that I've come to, um, I've had to change how I approach things or how I say things or how we have these dialogues. That's really crucial. And um, also, uh, don't keep that enmity towards the other because if each side has that, then we can never have these conversations. We can never really move forward. If you think that somebody, because of their current political view, if because of their current view about you, or a group that you represent, or a group that your friends are in, or whatever, is so negative that you cannot deal with who they are as people, once again, we'll be stuck in a rut, and we won't get out of it as a country. If you think that a little bit of ignorance, a little bit of misinformation, has caused them to be stuck in this mindset and you can liberate them through knowledge, right? Be excited about that concept. That's the right mindset to come to a conversation with. Don't come with this, oh God, I gotta talk to this guy again <laughs> at work or school. They have this weird view. Be excited about the opportunity to shed light. You know, be excited about the opportunity to, to remove ignorance because I feel like a little bit of ignorance is really holding us back and that's really about it. Um, I don't want to talk too much more because I want to have Mila answer more questions. So <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah.
something you see every day. Uh, so I guess my question is, you ask the average white American, who does an Asian American look like? They don't necessarily imagine someone who looks like y'all, you know? They imagine someone who looks like me, who is of East Asian descent. So I guess my question is, uh, what does being Asian American mean to you? And also, Wasi, what's your favorite menu item at Salem's Market? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, you know, it's uh, actually a very good question because my blood composition is very complex. And I don't, although I was born in one primarily, you know, a, a Muslim country of Kazakhstan as part of the Soviet Union. Um, uh, and I, I do not, I, I have only small, uh, I guess, uh, tinge of Asian blood in me. And what, what is, though, interesting is when I say I'm from Kazakhstan, you know, it's sort of like one of those stands, and I don't fit the ter stereotype. Um, so I, I, I can, I guess, I can speak about um, more about, you know, what, what, what it means for me to be an immigrant from Central Asia in America. I, um, I do... Um, I think it, when, I, when I initially was very um, excited about pursuing um, an immigration dream, I guess, to this country, is I honestly, um, um, I love it for what it stands. Uh, and I um, uh, love the people that inhabit this land because there is a lot of um, respect or at least it's been, you know, the political times have really changed us in the past two years. But there is respect for reason and I think for, um, you know, knowing people for, but there is also a lot of animosity. And being an immigrant, I think, you know, um, you hear things, you know, like some, uh, when, I, when I had different jobs that, you know, well, she's an immigrant, uh, you feel it when I, for example, with PBS, um, there wouldn't be uh, any, you know, they, they, they didn't want to establish a precedent with me giving me a work visa uh, because I'm an immigrant. Um, and it's, uh, I guess, you, you see those setbacks. Um, and you also realize how much I, I earlier spoke today about how much I benefited from being white. You know, because I, um, I benefited from the immigration system. I benefit consistently just because of the color of my skin. So I recognize that. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, um, I have an accent and a lot of journalism jobs, uh, I, I, you know, I, I haven't gotten one for sure because I didn't think that I had a good English um, and wasn't a native speaker. Uh, but I, I, I think that being an immigrant also gives me a big perspective um, and, and makes me treasure what we have here in the times that are that trying as today because um, I know what it is not to have it. I know what, what it is when the freedoms are stripped away. I know when the society become what it is when, what it is like when the society becomes cynic and when it becomes completely, um, um, I guess, impervious to truth and to accountability and honest dialogue. It's very fragile. We would like to think that these institutions are solid, but you know, it's been really troublesome, the developments of the couple of years. Mm -hmm. does, it, does this work now? Yeah. Okay. Just, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, hold it right to your mouth. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, you can hear it? Oh, cool. Yeah. Right. You can take it out. I'll try this one. Okay, perfect. That's a good question. Um, I think uh, it's complicated. Like, identity is really interesting because, like, Asian American is so broad. Uh, just like Muslim is so broad. You know, you can refer to so many different groups. So how I've always taken it is always, you know, like I use bridge analogies a lot. It's a Pittsburgh thing, I guess. I've uh, gotten there. So um, I see each person, you know, the, the, all of the identities that they are, groups that they associate themselves with, experiences that they've had is like kind of universes or worlds in and of themselves. And our goal is to kind of bridge the gap between those and reach an understanding and relationships and build those. So if that's possible, what that 
what these groups do, you know, they bring your worlds a little bit closer together. So now, um, as Asian Americans, I now feel like working with AAPI groups and in coalitions, I feel a responsibility to understand things that happen in our history, like Japanese internment and Chinese exclusion and what happened to Chinatown and Pittsburgh and, and what that means, as well as, as, as well as my own South Asian history, as well as my Muslim history. And all of that allows me to better empathize, uh, better create coalitions, better work together with other individuals. I think that's crucial. Whatever you can do to bring your worlds closer together is necessary. I think these groups are positive. I know a lot of people think that these groups are not as meaningful, API is so broad, South Asians and East Asians, is there really anything alike? But especially in American history, there's a lot of parallels between the Muslim community and API communities, South Asians and East Asians. There's things that we can understand, there's a lot of things we can work together on, there's ways that we can grow as communities together, and uh, I'm glad, I'm really proud to be amongst that large umbrella, and it's allowed, led me to create relationships that I probably wouldn't have had if we were um, from different continents, ironically enough, and learn a lot of lessons that I wouldn't have if it wasn't for being AAPI, and I uh, really have had a phenomenal time working with the Governor's Commission and the local API community, and the leadership is phenomenal. I see a lot of great work coming from that community. I see the next generation really, really rising up and taking a lot of positions of leadership. So I'm excited to kind of work with that community moving forward, and um, it's one of the things that I really am proud to identify with. Questions? Hi, Wasi and Mila, thanks for uh, speaking with us. I um, had a question for both of you. You both work in uh, spheres that can be very challenging uh, mentally for a person, so I was wondering what is the most rewarding or the most challenging thing that you've encountered in your line of work? You want to start first? <laughs> Shoot. Um, let's see. I mean, ch challenging is, is, is a little bit easier, you know, like aside from the work things, um, we're a community center as well as the Islamic Center of Pittsburgh. We're primarily a place of worship and uh, we're a spiritual center, but we also do the community events, weddings and, and um, you know, functions and somebody has a newborn, newborn child and all these kinds of things. But I mean, the hardest thing is always funerals, you know, I think um, I hadn't been to that many in, until I started at the center. Like I'd been to funerals and close family members and it's upsetting and it's difficult to deal with, but um, when you <laughs> run a community center, you make all these new friends, right? Um, like so thousands of Muslims in the area from everywhere and it's really, really exciting and great. But then it's, you know, the chances, which I never really thought of, of you knowing somebody that you see like almost every other day or every Friday or, or whatever, and then having them pass away and then having to, we have a very personal process, which I really, really appreciate in Islam about how we do our burial practices. We do everything ourselves. We wash the body ourselves. We dig the hole ourselves. We bury the person ourselves. We, we don't, uh, it's, it's meant to be a reflection. It's meant to be a time to really, you know, um, reflect upon death. So that's been the hardest part, I'd say, you know, because I, it's probably because I'm, I'm younger and I didn't get to reflect upon it enough before I entered the job. And then, then seeing so many in a row, and uh, also, like, um, so many young, we had a lot of young people in the last, like, in, it's been 11 people under the age of 26 in the last three and a half years. And um, that is not what I expected, you know? I don't hear about them that much in the media. Like, I don't, I don't know when, maybe they don't publish that stuff because it happens, but I just didn't realize um, how often that happens and how tragic that is or when somebody who's like the sole provider passes and then what happens, you know? Like, you mourn, you go to a funeral and you come back, but then, yeah, so I think dealing with deaths and, and the, and the follow-up to that has been absolutely the hardest part. Um, successes, I'd say, um, I, uh, my favorite things by far are going to rural communities and having open dialogues. <laughs> you know, I, might, I love encouraging really controversial questions to be asked and then like really working through those and I'll offer some up to loosen up the crowd and it gets interesting because seeing um, my first year I made a lot of mistakes in terms of my event scheduling that I, I had one too many echo chambers the first year. <laughs> you know, a lot of preaching to the choir and I was, I didn't realize, I don't know the city uh, you know, and well enough to realize which ones were which. And then, then the last couple of years, I focused a lot more on getting outside the city, you know, going further, going to groups that wouldn't agree with me. 
and uh, then having some dialogues and getting to learn which things you know go over well and and how to really have a discussion and and uh, and um, the biggest thing about that is that I feel like every opportunity is uh, opportunity to learn myself and going to the rural communities I've learned so much you know I've, I didn't grow up in one I grew up in a suburban community and then came here or in the city so I didn't really understand their issues I didn't understand what was going on I didn't understand why they're like for example like the anti-immigrant feeling and sentiment is so strong and once I better understood it then I could explain to them why it might be misplaced uh, in a way that I'm actually trying to be empathetic and uh, I actually know and care about their issues because I know and have friends who deal with those issues as opposed to before where I just read about it that whole thing I was talking about it just the thought you know like and and just thought without like learning, you know, that concept of just thinking without actually, you know, using what you've learned. But now I feel like I have what I've learned and I can be much more empathetic in that situation. So I think that's probably my favorite things when people change their minds, who I don't expect to change their minds, you know, not that I'm stereotyping, but sorry. <laughs> yeah. I would say for me the most difficult, I guess, times uh, were when our reporting is being challenged um, or dismissed as if fake news or, you know, or um, sort of name calling and ad hominem. I think that as much as, um, you know, um, I, it's, it's gonna be a huge generalization and there are a lot of, I think, uh, leaders who are um, uh, great and um, really uh, care about the community, but I don't think, people in power don't like to be questioned and they don't like um, inconvenient questions or um, transparency. And I think it sh it's not just on the national level. It doesn't matter which party you belong to. I think it, it exists everywhere. And um, I have felt it firsthand in Pittsburgh. And I think it's, um, you know, the best, that, the best response to that type of attack is to um, keep doing the work and be able to defend it. You know, that you know that your work is solid, that you did your thorough reporting, and um, you uh, were clear about you know, the processes and the reason that was guiding you. Um, and also, you know, the, the, we, it, it, besides the investigative and sort of enterprise reporting that we do, we also really work with the community uh, folks who want to tell their story. And that takes a lot of energy because, you know, people don't see sometimes themselves as a writers. They don't know what, how fact-checking works. And you really want to foster and integrate that knowledge in the community. So first-person storytelling is really important. As one person who supports Public Source tell, told me recently, it is the source of unvarnished truth, your lived experience. And maybe there is a danger of a single story, obviously, but there is also power in the personal story that you cannot dismiss. And we work on that. And those are sometimes very difficult um, um, areas to navigate, but they are, uh, you know, and, and from some people, they will, well, you're giving platform to people who don't deserve it. And, and there is no such thing. We're public source. We're public. So, you know, it, it's a platform for everyone. And, um, but I, I would say that there are so many rewarding experiences about my job. One is that, you know, you see the passion of especially um, a young generation of people who want to be journalists, who see the value in it. And, you know, to be able to uh, show them what it takes and what the work is and trust them is really powerful. When people print out our articles and go to community meetings and, you know, nobody shows to the zoning board meeting but the uh, public source published an article and now there are 100 people they can flip it in, that's powerful. You know, then now suddenly the community arms itself with the story and argues with people, with officials, with facts and information. Um, you know, when uh, we wrote a story about Chatham and how uh, sort of the, um, how uh, it's in their students' uh, co code that mental health issue get penalized and there were three 
uh, or disciplined, they, people get disciplined for having mental health problems. Um, and three uh, young women were willing to share with us um, this, their stories. And they changed that policy uh, as a result of our reporting. The same with police accountability. Now procurement process works completely different thanks to public source. You know, there are also questions and, you know, people pass around, you know, I have this wild story where it's not, it's an embarrassing uh, story for the city, but we were um, covering a story about it, how the city of Pittsburgh, is it, it, how protected it is against a cyber attack. And, you know, we work a lot with, with public records, so we file the most re record requests for which we also were reprimanded than any other newsroom in the state of Pennsylvania, and we are 10 people. But, you know, what's interesting is that uh, we requested the audit of the, um, of the protection of the, of the software, of the IT system in the city of Pittsburgh, and they gave us the report, but it was redacted. My, my reporter took the report, copy pasted it into the Word doc and could read everything in there because they don't know how to redact a document, a PDF document. But, you know, it's a good thing that a reporter got it. What if somebody else, we, could, we saw all the information about the data center, about how they are, you know, where are they storing it, everything, right? And so as a result of it, it's like, it's, it's, um, it's, it was an embarrassing story for the city, and we took an embarrassing, you know, path, or, or I guess, uh, I, not embarrassing, uh, we took a path of, we're not gonna publish this, obviously. It's a responsible thing to do, but you should fix this. <laughs> and, 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 you know, sometimes by showing the flaw and pointing out the problem, um, that's, uh, I guess that's, then the issue can be fixed. So those are rewarding experiences, but I would say that, you know, when, even when young people uh, write for us and um, share their stories, and then as a result of them say, uh, say that, you know, because of your story, like somebody reached out, I made a connection, I now uh, have a job, or, you know, like things like that, that are small, very, it's, they're not scale story, they're not policy change stories, but they're really rewarding and powerful. And I got, a, I got a positive one. Um, so get, anybody hear the impact story? So there's like um, in North Allegheny, uh, there was a security company that was using anti-Muslim rhetoric and kind of scapegoating our community to sell their product of safety. You know, like we're dangerous. It actually um, listed the Islamic Center of Pittsburgh as a local terrorist organization. You know, like on a hate map that they were like shared from a, a hate group that exists nationally. And um, when this came to light, you know, we, we went to the, um, uh, the school board meeting, public stores did a lot of great work on it, uh, really, you know, pushed that narrative so the public got to hear about it. There was a packed meeting, and the school board actually cut the contract. And then a lot of other people got to hear about who this company really is. And that's important because for a minority community that's often targeted, to see that the media and other people and allies will help us to make sure that there are repercussions to using, uh, putting us in that position and using us, that's crucial, you know? Because now companies are less likely to do it. Like, yeah, that might have worked as your marketing ploy before, but now we're gonna make sure you get every contract you have cut. If you do this, um, that's huge, right? And then we're really thankful that Mila and the whole team did it, so. Hi, so both of your work tends to revolve around, you said, conversations, whether it's having them, providing a space for them, um, and engaging in them yourselves around topics that are particularly tricky to sort of navigate. So I was wondering what strategies do both of you use to have those conversations so that they're productive um, and meaningful rather than can sort of just uh, spin out into destructive uh, arguments? Okay, I can start that. <laughs> um, so, uh, I mean, I guess like internal checklist stuff, like things I make sure that I do that I feel like um, will avoid it escalating is that, um, are you listening, you know, kind of checks, like are you waiting to talk? <laughs> you know, if you have your points ready and you're just waiting to get it out, then like it usually will lead to um, very heated conversations because like you're not even waiting to listen 
And then I think people, whether consciously or subconsciously, pick up on that, and then they're ready to respond, and then it just keeps escalating, and then it's out of control. <laughs> um, and if you actually listen and then say question and ask about what their point of view is and ask more of these like how, what, why questions instead of just kind of these imposing things, you know, like this is like um, telling people how they feel, you know, try to listen to how they feel and figure out like where their views really come from. Because a lot of times if you, they hold a view that you believe is extremely, extremely incorrect, <laughs> you know, and uneducated and ignorant or whatever, um, there, you can you can dig there, you know, you could figure out where that came from, you know, like ask like questions about how do you come to hold that belief, you know, how strongly do you believe that and other things and it calms the situation down, you can have a better understanding of where they're at and um, by the end of that, if you ask more questions and listen more than you kind of talk, that's usually a good <laughs> strategy and um, uh, also like really, really listen and try to get a hold of, if you're talking about different differing viewpoints and that's the conversations we're moderating or having, um, Drilling down to the whys of it, you know, like um, human need is, is in, and human desire and all this behavior stuff is a lot of the stuff I ended up studying. So, like, it really boils down to typically a couple things. And if you really get to know why, like, if you hate immigrants because of your concern for the safety of your family, or is it you hate it because um, you believe that you're going to lose your job? You know, like, if you know which one it is, you can better tailor the rest of your conversation. So, like, make sure you kind of get to the real root of it instead of imposing a root. You know, like, if I assume everybody's Islamophobic because, like, um, their pastor told them to or, like, some thing that I just see, like, I heard one story of that, and then that's my entire view. But if I can then really figure out, like, okay, where did your anti-Muslim views come from, you know, like, then you can get down to how does it change. You know, sometimes it's pretty easy, but if you never dig down to that surface, you're just fighting on the superficial level and you'll never really change anybody's mind. And, you know, um, I don't know if that's helpful. You know, it's, it's a great question because you, you, we also exist in several spaces, right? In, in holding conversations or just online. And online can be a destructive place, you know, in the way that uh, sometimes I remember when after the election uh, we published a first person piece for, uh, of a mom who voted for Trump. And you won't believe the type of phone calls I got. Um, when we published diversity or race and equity um, issues, the same thing, you know, the type of uh, phone calls, letters. Um, there are also, there is also an issue, I think, urban, um, uh, rural divide in Pennsylvania when we go to, I gave this example earlier, in Waynes, to Waynesburg or Connellsville. It's a completely different environment, right? You come in and there is, when you say, you're, I'm a journalist or reporter, you know, well, well, fake news, you know? And, and then you try to just have a conversation and the time it takes to gain that trust is, is a lot of time. So, you know, we have, we have um, a talk about failures and mistakes. I mean, after the election, we had this whole project, Small Town, Pennsylvania, where we thought we can come to Waynesburg, buy some pizza, and have a conversation. And then <laughs> we organized it, and we ate that pizza all by ourselves with two retired teachers <laughs> who came to have a conversation. <laughs> and talk about the bubble, right? <laughs> Uh, but we did, and the project did en end up uh, panning out because what we did this summer is that um, a colleague of mine, Hallie Stockton, uh, partnered with a news organization, 100 Days in Appalachia, and we went to little, little, little League games. You know, we brought ice cream, we had a bowl of questions, and people just ate ice cream, they pull a question. Um, a reporter would pull a question. So it was like almost like getting to know each other rather than I'm interrogating you because it takes time to build trust. And I think that uh, especially in the communities where they, people, it's, it's easy to live in the, oh, fake news, fake news. You hear this all the time. You just have to follow our president, you know? And, um, and then when you meet a reporter, you actually, okay, well, uh, you actually, you know, you, you start having a conversation. And if you truly see this as, uh, you know, an invested sort of person-to-person -person connection, that, that gets different, but it does take time. And I think that if uh, there is a project of sort of cultural exchange, I would really want to see both 
urban kids from Ellis or, you know, or um, uh, Alderdice, go to Connellsville and, you know, talk to, spend a day or a week with uh, Connellsville kids and do the same for Connellsville kids. Bring them here to the city and allow them to spend a week here, you know, because I, we don't have a sense of how uh, politically, uh, what is political awareness of the next generation, of kids that are growing up, of kids that who are seni seniors or middle schoolers. We don't do political polling of them because they're not yet voters, but they will be in four years. So, you know, or, or even, uh, or even um, sooner. What I'm just saying is that uh, I think it's hard. It takes a lot of time. It does take a lot of discomfort because we like to imagine that we know everything and, you know, um, we're educated. And, but, but the thing is that it's, um, it does take a lot of um, courage and I think just recognizing that you don't live that life and you don't know what it's like and you're speaking from the position of your privilege. And Oh yeah, I was going to say like what I, what I mentioned the whole thing of like be ready to challenge your own viewpoints. I feel like I didn't realize personally and how many of my friends when our entire lives like believing things that we never really challenge because everybody within our circle just buys it anyway. So if you've never challenged your own views and you're not prepared for that to happen, then can't really have a conversation. And you can do it yourself, you know, like as a good starter before you really get into a dialogue uh, to be educated, like think about something you believe. Do you really want immigrants here? You know, isn't that going to cost us money? Isn't that going to like take money away from people in need in this country? We can't take care of them. Why don't we? Why don't we bring more people? Answer those questions yourselves, and then bring it to a conversation. Um, it's out there. You can read anything online uh, before you get in to prepare yourself. So that's it. Thanks, Wasi. Thank you very much, both of you. Very much. I want to um, invite you to stay. Uh, we've got food and refreshment. And I also want to invite you to visit the tables of two of our partners who have worked with us over the years, um, two organizations that are really promoting uh, young leadership in Pittsburgh, uh, attracting and retaining young talent in Pittsburgh, uh, Pulse and Pump. So please stop by their, their, their table. Um, and if you'll indulge me just one more minute, um, I want to just say a word or two about our two guests today. Um, we study leadership in the Johnson Institute. We have a research agenda as well as a service agenda and teaching agenda. And we've been particularly curious about the characteristics, the qualities, the skill sets that define leadership. And, 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 and we've done a great deal of work on that, as a matter of fact. And I just want to share with you some reflections um, on today because I've had the privilege, the honor of spending the entire day uh, with Wasi and Mila. It began today at lunch with a group of students uh, and the conversation was just electric. It was astonishing. Uh, we then went to a meeting of a group of students who are self-organized here in Gispia who on a weekly basis are taking on big issues of diversity and inclusion and that was a, an equally interesting and, and, and revealing discussion. And what I've seen in both of these young people is the following qualities of leadership. Stewardship is the first one I I think of. They're, they're both committed to leaving this world and their space stronger and better than when they inherited it. They're committed to leaving the assets to which they've been entrusted stronger and better than when they inherited it. And I think that overall is probably really defines leadership in many ways. But I also was struck, especially over lunch, at the courage both of them have had to step into a space, whether it is um, freedom of the press, or promoting dialogue um, in, uh, in, an, in an environment, especially Wasi's notion of going to rural communities, uh, courage. Um, and both of them shared stories that I won't get into of, of, of other incidents that have occurred to them in their journey of leadership, and, and they were astonishing. A, a third quality of courage, or excuse me, curiosity, and I cannot tell you how impressed I am by the curiosity of these two people to get at whether it's the, 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 the root of a story um, or whether it is the root of someone's attitudes or beliefs uh, about Muslims. The curiosity and the patience it takes to get there. They're both really de dedicated to truth and fact-based dialogue. 
And I don't think it's any secret after today that they really do both possess remarkable communication skills. Uh, they choose their words carefully. Uh, they think through uh, what they want to say before they say it. Um, they're thoughtful. They're engaged. And they're both really engaged also in the commitment to accountability. And those are some of the um, traits I've seen in both of them over the last seven hours or so uh, with them. And I want to thank you for teaching me more about those qualities and for sharing them with our group today. So once again, help me welcome them.